Hello. In today's program, we have a variety of stories. An investigation into abuse at a school for deaf children. We're here in Scotland, witnessing an historic moment in British Sign Language. And we're behind the scenes on the set of Doctor Who. This is See Here. In today's programme, the BSL Scotland Bill is currently underway and we will be following its progress with potential new powers for sign language. And the first ever sign language user is appearing on Doctor Who. We took a peek behind the scenes. I can't force you to leave. So you can stay and do the whole cabin in the woods thing and get killed or drowned if you want. But my first priority is to protect my crew. We start with an investigation into the historical abuse of deaf children. See Here's Erica Jones has been collaborating with the programme Newsnight on a story that once revealed could have a major impact on the deaf community. In one deaf school in London, deaf children were subjected to abuse time after time. As adults, they have now come forward to tell Erica about their experiences. Please be aware, this film may be distressing to some viewers. It was something that took place every day, at any time, morning, evening, round the clock. And I didn't see my family from when I was four until 11. I was a prisoner in that school. Woodford School for the Deaf closed more than 20 years ago. This is the original site. It was the scene of terrible sexual abuse spanning three decades. As adults, 28 of the children abused here were later ready to testify in court against their abuser. But the court case collapsed. For the first time, we hear their story and reveal the identity of their abuser. In 1951, teacher Beatrice Ingall and her husband Eric set up a private nursery for young deaf children in Woodford, East London. Mrs Ingall taught the pupils while her husband was the bursar, driver and handyman. The Ingalls lived in the house that the young boarders slept in. By the late 1950s, Eric Ingall, then in his 30s, had begun to assault some of the children in their beds. <laughs> I was disgusted and I was afraid. He said thank you and walked off. I was afraid and I didn't sleep well after that. He then came again twice a week for a few months. Mrs Ingall, shown here in a 1974 documentary about the school, was actually aware of the abuse, according to Miriam and other former pupils we've spoken to. Mr Ingall's wife came and she saw and she completely wasn't bothered and left me there with him and went back to her bedroom. The age of children who were abused ranged from three to 11. Many were too young to even understand what was happening. I didn't know anything. I thought it was supposed to be fun and that it was acceptable. I just went along with it. I didn't realize. 
David only realized much later that what had happened was criminal. I trained to become a youth worker. I wanted to work with young people. I went on a training course where we learned about different types of abuse. When we were taught about sexual abuse, I took that on board. And that's when looking back I realised that was what had happened to me. There's no suggestion that anybody shown in the 1974 documentary was involved in the abuse. Woodford used speech and lip reading to teach the children. At the time, sign language was not widely taught in schools. The fact that the pupils sometimes struggled to communicate made it easier for Ingalls' behaviour to pass unnoticed. <laughs> If we do, we're very panicked, yeah, you know, with a ruler, or hacking all the time. There was a busy road with a playground, and there'd be people walking past. But we had no communication because we couldn't speak, we couldn't sign, and they couldn't understand our voices, so we'd try and write notes. But our vocabulary was limited. The only word we knew was rude. We'd make paper aeroplanes and throw them. People would pick them up, read them and laugh and wave and go on their way, and we would feel frustrated. At the end of the summer holiday in 1964, James's mother became suspicious about his reluctance to return to Woodford School. He eventually told her what had been happening. I just talked about it to her, and then she said, right, you're not going back to that school. You've finished at that school. We never talked about it again, never. James was immediately removed from the school by his mother. After making inquiries, she discovered something shocking. Earlier that year, Ingall had pleaded guilty to indecently assaulting two of the school's pupils. He had asked for seven other offences to be taken into consideration. The detective working on the case said Ingall was a man of previous good character and a former mayor of Woodford had testified in his favour, suggesting that overwork might have caused the lapse. Stratford Court fined Ingle 50 pounds and placed him on probation for two years with the condition that he should absent himself from the school buildings while children were there. A freedom of information request has revealed that the Department for Education also disqualified Ingle from being a proprietor of the school. James's mother wrote to the school to complain and referred to the newspaper article. Mrs Ingle replied, I am puzzled by your wish to have a copy of a local newspaper. Why not write to me and ask for details? Why be so devious? Ingle continued his abuse throughout the probation period and into the next decade. Another complaint was lodged with the school in 1970. Mrs Ingle informed parents that the police decided not to proceed further. She also criticised deliberate and malicious rumour mongering and warned, before the inevitable bricks begin to fly, may I remind you that nothing now can hurt Mr Ingle anymore. Bricks can now only rebound against your child. Mrs Ingle finally retired as headmistress in 1984. By this time, local authorities were moving away from the use of specialist schools to educate deaf children in favour of mainstream schooling. Pupil numbers at the school fell sharply and it eventually closed down in 1991. For Sandra, things were also coming to a head as the effects of her abuse contributed to a breakdown. I was Sandra's allegations in 1992 were investigated by police, but no action was taken as Ingle, then in his late 60s, was thought to be senile. Another seven years passed before a fresh effort was made to bring him to justice. A group of us rallied together and wanted to bring it up again. We had access to interpreters, 
Therefore, there was better communication. There was one woman who was great, Anne Stewart. She was passionate and believed in us. Anne was a child abuse investigator for the Met. She worked on the case for almost five years, including considerable time spent trying to persuade the court that Ingle was fit to stand trial. The case eventually came before a judge in March 2004. On the second day of the hearing, Judge Burr announced that the trial could not proceed. Firstly, he said the length of time that had passed meant there was a paucity of material and lack of available witnesses, many of whom have subsequently died. Secondly, the judge said, I do not wish to criticise the complainants in any way at all, but it cannot be right for people to allow another 15 or 20 years to go by before drawing the attention of the competent authorities to instances of historical abuse. He also cited Ingle's age. I was so happy. I was so happy. Sorry, but in a way, I feel I want to cry. I've always been so upset. People. I'm sorry. I felt angry. So angry. I couldn't believe it. I was lost. I was so angry. So frustrated. If you've missed the cutoff point, then it's too late. I didn't know that. I was surprised, but if we'd done it earlier, well, we weren't ready. We didn't have the power. We didn't have the access. It demonstrates a complete lack of uh, empathy and understanding in terms of this, of child sexual abuse because he didn't give uh, the survivors their opportunity to tell their story and had he done, he would have heard uh, why it's so difficult for a victim to be able to tell, uh, what's ha to, to tell someone what's happened to them. So yeah, it was very, very unhelpful and naive. The problems facing deaf children reporting abuse have been documented by the NSPCC. When we ask deaf adults to talk about the problems during their childhood abuse, the evidence is that when they tried to disclose as a child to an adult, they were ignored, or the adult didn't believe the child had been abused. They just didn't believe them. I told my mother and father, but they didn't believe me, even when I was older. I don't know why, they thought I was talking rubbish. We know with hearing children, it takes up to seven and a half years for them to disclose. So you can imagine for a deaf child, it's much longer. After the 2004 trial was halted, the witnesses abandoned their attempt to bring Ingle to justice. In 2012, Eric Ingle died. It would be easy to dismiss what happened at Woodford as the product of another era, but concerns around the protection of deaf children remain today. They are three times more vulnerable to being abused than hearing children. Even with lots of residential deaf schools closing down, the sexual abuse and other types of abuse are continuing. Efforts to improve the protection of deaf children from abuse will continue, but it's little comfort to those who failed to get justice. Our lives are really spoilt, myself and others as well. Now I'll tell you, in all my life I've never had a boyfriend. I'm not married, I hate men, throughout my life, because of him. Thank you, Erica. If you feel you've been affected by the issues raised in this film, please write to us or email us at seehere at bbc.co.uk. Now, British...